coming up on this episode of Photography Online. We take you along on a sunrise shoot, we tell you where you can and can't save money in photography, and we continue our Aurora Photography feature. Over the next 35 minutes we'll give you all that and more. Welcome to part two of our February episode of Photography Online, which is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. If you don't know, VPNs allow you to connect to the internet via an encrypted tunnel which maintains your online privacy and protects your sensitive data. We'll be telling you more about that soon, but let's get this show on the road. We've already introduced a few new features for 2021, and here is another. Just the two of us will see you tagging along on a landscape shoot to get in on the action. There's no camera operator, no sound man, no producer, and as you'll see, definitely no hair and makeup department. This is the only time you'll ever see Marcus with a selfie stick, so it's worth watching just for that. Well, I don't know what time of day it is where you are, but here it's very early in the morning. But what a morning it is, check that out. So this is the, uh, well, this rock here is actually called the Old Man of Store. Uh, but this rock here is called Cathedral Rock for obvious reasons. Um, and there was a forecast of a good sunrise this morning. So I walked up here and just taking some shots as the color appears in the sky. I thought it was a good opportunity to go through some histogram uh, stuff with you. So, so you can see my histogram here. I don't care about this side because this is uh, this area here is is jet black. I don't care if I don't have detail in that rock there, um, but I do want detail in the sky in the brightest part of the sky. So you see the histograms all the way over to the right hand side. But when you look at the colours there, they're very warm. So the this uh, average histogram here, which is just the white one, is showing that I'm not clipping the highlights. Can you see it's not touching the right hand side there? But crucially, when I take the shot, you'll see that the red channel is actually clipping. And if you can see that there, the reason why the, the white one looks like it's not clipping is because there's hardly any green and blue there. So um, two out of the three colors are quite low. So it's only the red, which is clipping. So when you average those three out, you get that that's showing it's not clipping but it is actually clipping so I need to pull the exposure down on this very slightly let's try another one see even that there the red is right over to the right hand side but I think I'll get away with that what you have to bear in mind is this is a JPEG even though I'm shooting in RAW this is showing me a JPEG because the camera can't display a RAW file so this histogram here is for the JPEG. It's not for the RAW file. So when I take that into Lightroom or Photoshop and look at the RAW, I'll be able to recover that and it probably won't even be clipping anyway. It's only clipping there because it's on the JPEG. But obviously the, the luminance levels are rising all the time. So every minute or so I have to adjust my exposure. Always work in manual, never ever work in aperture priority or any of the semi or automatic modes. With manual, you've got full control. The camera's got no idea what these tones should be, so there's no point in leaving it up to the camera to decide that very important decision. So when you're in a situation like this, shooting digitally at least, um, it's best to take uh, photos every sort of 30 seconds because the light's changing all the time, but your eyes don't see the changes so much because it's happening so gradually. Um, but when you take photos every 30 seconds to a minute and you look through them, you'll see massive changes between each one. So even though you don't think that the lights change and you think oh, I've got that photo already just keep taking them it's digital it's free you can always delete the ones that you don't want yeah let's try something on its side oh yeah hello hello it's got magazine cover written all over it that has If you want to get into making money by selling your photos to image libraries or publishers, always shoot with enough room for text at the top of the frame. 
as this is what editors and designers often look for in an image. It's also good to think about leaving other areas for text to be added to. So I've got the film camera out now. I've got some uh, expired Fuji Velvia, just because I don't have any in-date stuff left. Um, but, so it's a bit of an experiment. You never know quite how it's gonna come out. It might be good, it might be pants. But uh, the scene's changed a little bit from when I was shooting with the digital. So the colors have gone, but we've still got this beautiful texture to the sky. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm metering for the brightest point of the scene. And that's telling me that it's uh, F22 at an eighth of a second. Fuji Velvia, you can tend to kind of overexpose a mid-tone, which is what that's just given me, by about one and a half to two stops. So instead of F22 at an eighth, I'm gonna to go to F11 and a half at an eighth. We'll take one of these. This, uh, as I'm winding this on, it's not feeling quite right. It feels like the, something's catching inside, so hopefully that's okay. Let's try something in the portrait. Orientation as well. Now the spirit level on this camera only works when it's in uh, landscape mode. I've got to be careful not to fall off the back of this rock here. Um, so, best way to judge whether the camera's level is just come back and look at the top and the bottom of the camera kind of line it up with the horizon. Yeah, it's all looking good. Ready for another one. Right, let's just do another meter reading. Yeah, it's got a third of a stop brighter, so we'll come down to, uh, let's go F11 at a 15th. Oh no. Feels all right now. That's, it's like the worst film winding experience I've ever had, I think. Let's have a look, see what's happened. Looks all right. With the photos I had come to get already safely in the bag, the light was still good. So rather than heading home, I decided to go in search of a higher viewpoint. I've come too high. I lost the drama of that rock there. Go down again. It's always good to go exploring, as it often leads to new ideas which wouldn't have occurred otherwise. <sighs> Just don't do it when the light is epic, unless you've already got your main shot in the bag. Wonder if we go over here, actually. We get the sun flaring through one of the windows. So if I position myself so the sun's coming through those, all I need to do is look for the patch of light on the floor and that's where I need to be however it's not easy to see in this uh, boulder field I think I can see it there you go you should see that now how does that look I think we can call that a morning go back and get some breakfast I trust you enjoyed tagging along, letting Marcus do all the hard graft while you still get to enjoy the views. As always, a few tips were shared, so hopefully you learned something too. We'll be filming more adventures like that over the coming months, so make sure you're subscribed to our channel so you can easily see when we release a new video. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the show, this episode is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. So to quickly tell us how that could benefit you, here's Harry. As photographers, we spend much of our time online, whether we're downloading apps to our phones or uploading images to our social media and websites. We constantly rely on being connected to the internet. Ensuring the safety and privacy of all that information then is paramount. VPNs encrypt all of your data, whether you're at home or on public Wi-Fi, keeping you safe. Surfshark's clean web feature protects you from malware, targeting and dodgy internet scams. It even helps to protect you from those annoying pop-up ads that seem to creep up everywhere these days. 
Surfshark is the only service that lets you connect an unlimited number of devices with just a single membership. That means you can keep your phone, tablet, and computers all protected at once. Surfshark is dead easy to set up and the best value service out there. If you want to give it a go, you can use the code photography to get a massive 83% off and three extra months free. There's really nothing to lose with a 30 day money back guarantee as well. Give it a go using the links in the description below. Thanks, Harry. Now, as many of you will have probably realised, photography can be an expensive pastime. However, it doesn't have to be this way, and there are many areas where you can save money without sacrificing your results. There are also areas where trying to save money can actually end up costing you more. So, to arm us with all the information that you need, we thought we would put together our own guide of where you can and can't save money on photography. Let's face it, photography can be an expensive hobby, especially if you want the latest gear and all the accessories, but it doesn't have to cost a fortune to get a decent kit. If you're on a budget but don't want to sacrifice the quality of your photos, then knowing where to save money can be crucial. If I only had a budget of £100 or so, then I could buy a camera, but I probably wouldn't be selling any of my prints unless I labelled them as fine art, in which case you could sell pretty much anything. If you wanted to get a complete camera kit from scratch, capable of producing professional looking results, then it wouldn't be difficult to spend many thousands of pounds or dollars in the process. A camera body alone is going to make a serious dent in your wallet and that's not going to be any good to you without a lens or two and of course a decent bag to keep everything in. It all adds up very quickly. So what can we do to reduce the costs without sacrificing the results we get? Let's start with the camera body. If you look at most DSLRs or mirrorless bodies on the market, many of them try to cater for a wide range of genres by adding as many features as possible. Take the Canon R5 as an example. This is a 45 megapixel camera which shoots at 20 frames a second, has amazing autofocus including animal eye detect, shoots 8K video, has the best inbuilt image stabilisation and has an ISO range which tops out at 51,200. Now that's all very impressive, but if you shoot only landscapes, then the only part of those specs which are going to be in use to you is the 45 megapixel resolution part. This camera will set you back 4,000 in whichever currency you're dealing with. But if you want a camera which the AI can take amazing landscape images, you can get just as good results for a fraction of the price. Enter the Canon 5D SR. This is now over five years old, yet in my experience, it's still to be surpassed in terms of image quality for a full frame camera. Compared to the R5, its autofocus speed and frames per second will seem glacial and you won't want to use it at anything over ISO 400. And if you want to shoot video on it, then forget 8K or even 4K. This thing only does 1080. But when it comes to capturing fine detail in a landscape environment, nothing can beat this camera. Now this is largely to do with the fact that this is a 50 megapixel camera, but it also has something to do with the fact that this has no low pass filter in it, something which many cameras don't offer you the option to go without. Now, this camera is very limited in what it can do, so a good all-rounder it is not, but it does excel in one particular area, which is landscapes. So if this is the area which you find yourself taking the most photos in, then you could pick one of these up very recently for under a thousand pounds in very good condition. However, that's now changed and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now I'm not suggesting that you all go out and buy a 5D SR, but the point I'm making is that you don't necessarily need an all singing, all dancing camera if you only want it to hum the simplest of melodies. If you own an R5 and never use the video features or the lightning fast animal eye detect or the 20 frames per second, etc., etc., then as great as these are, you're paying for features that you simply do not need. If you only ever upload your images to a website or your social media pages, then you don't need much more than 18 megapixels. Buying a 50 megapixel beast of a camera then is really surplus to requirements. Some might argue that having lots of extra resolution allows you to crop more aggressively. And while this might be factually true, it's not good practice to compose like this. The truth is you can save a lot of money on a lower resolution camera simply by zooming in a bit or walking closer to your subject. Get the composition right at the capture stage where it should be done. A moment ago I mentioned that you could pick up one of these for around a thousand pounds, but this is no longer the case. So what's changed? 
Well, in March last year, Canon announced that they were stopping production of the 5DSR. So this has made them very difficult to get hold of, which has pushed the price way back up. And today they're almost double what they were a year ago. So timing your purchases well can save you a lot of money. So while it might be nice to have the latest all singing, all dancing camera, you will pay top dollar for the privilege. Whereas if you buy a model that's just about to be superseded, then you'll get it for a bargain price. Camera equipment depreciates as soon as they're superseded because older models just aren't as desirable to own as newer models. However, newer models don't always give better performance in terms of image quality, so never upgrade just for the sake of it. Camera bodies are where most of the technology lives, so it's these which are updated more often than lenses, which can be on the market for 10 or more years before they're given a revamp. Therefore, if you want to buy equipment which holds its value, buy decent lenses rather than spending lots of money on a camera body, as good glass will hold its value if looked after. For example, if you buy a used Prospect lens in good condition for £800, in two years' time it will probably still be worth around £800. A camera body is likely to lose far more in depreciation so lenses are a wiser investment, but only if they are top spec in the first place. One way you can spend a lot of money without realising it is by building up a huge collection of lenses. Let's be honest, you aren't going to be carrying around more than two or three lenses at most. So while it may be tempting to buy everything from ultra wide angle to super telephoto, be realistic and just buy the lenses you're likely to use most often. There is no standard lens which is perfect for everyone, as we all take different photos and have different requirements for what we need our lenses to do. But there's a lot to be said for having just one lens and making do with it. Lens makers such as Sigma, Tamron and Tekina make lenses in most camera mount fittings. And they usually offer a saving on what it costs to buy a Nikon, Canon or Sony lens. Historically, third-party lenses were no good at all, but today that is no longer the case. Lenses such as Sigma's art range often outperform own brand lenses, yet can cost 30 to 50% less. This is a great way of saving money without sacrificing image quality, but as with everything, it comes down to your individual needs. Sigma lenses are often heavier than own brand lenses, so if weight is a priority for you, then you need to consider this. But for the price alone, it's a clear way to save money without sacrificing image quality. There are endless options when it comes to photography gadgets, but most people can get by with four basic items. Camera, lens, tripod and bag. Yes, you can add things like filters and cable releases, etc. But ask yourself if they're really necessary and if you can do without them. We're keen users of filters here at Photography Online, so the last thing we're going to do is tell you that you don't need them. The point is, only buy them if you need them, and only buy the ones you're likely to use. If you don't know which ones you're likely to use, then you don't need them. A polarizer and a heavy neutral density filter are probably the most useful, as the effect these provide cannot be achieved in other ways, whereas some photographers don't bother with graduated filters as they can achieve the same effect by bracketing their exposures and merging multiple shots at the post-production stage. Personally, I like to use graduated filters and get the shot right in camera, not at the computer. This is just my preference. There's no right or wrong, only whatever is the best way for you. The only caveat to this is that if you do buy filters, then don't try and save money by buying the cheap ones, as there's little point in spending lots of money on a decent lens and then putting a cheap piece of glass or plastic in front of it. The used camera market has everything except the latest releases and often at prices that are only a fraction of their original value. Many people are understandably wary about buying used gear privately, such as from eBay for example, as there's often no guarantee the equipment is fully working or it will continue to work. This is where buying from a reputable dealer such as Ford's Photographic comes into its own. They literally have thousands of items of quality gear for sale at great prices. All of their gear is inspected by experts and is usually sold with a three month warranty for peace of mind. Often used gear is in such good condition that you wouldn't know it wasn't new so it's well worth checking out if you want to save some cash. I've put a link down below to the Ford's website who've got some great quality used gear. Just be aware though they change their stock a lot so if you're looking for something in particular keep checking back. Some things such as a tripod should really only need to be bought once so if you buy a good quality one 
providing you don't lose it or damage it in some way, then it should last a lifetime. The alternative is, is that you go for the cheaper option and you buy something which is only going to last you a year or two and you're going to have to replace it many, many times in the same space that you would own a decent tripod. So buying once can really be a wise choice. Finally, here are a few items where you definitely do not want to be trying to save money. Memory cards. Do not buy cheap memory. This is where all your work is going to be saved, so spending a little more on reputable brands is money well spent. Delkin are so confident about the quality of their memory that they offer a lifetime guarantee on all their products. When you buy a lens from a shop, quite often they'll try and sell you a UV or protection filter. My advice, save your money. You're much better off using the included lens hoods that comes with most lenses. These are far better protection because without them, yeah, that's not done it any good at all. With a lens hood, that wouldn't have happened. I hope that gives you a few ideas on where you could save a few pennies. If you have any money saving tips that you'd like to share then please do feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Now if you haven't seen part one of this month's show then you'll have missed Wild Diaries where we shot some deer on Dartmoor with a camera of course as well as seeing how a newly emerged otter cub was learning some basic survival skills. We also took you along on a property shoot to show you how to take interior photos for maximum marketing impact and we gave some of your photos a darn good examination in the photography online surgery and look to how to get yourself in the right place at the right time for photographing the aurora borealis that show as well as all of our other ones are available on our channel so do take a look to make sure that you haven't missed any now if you watched the first part of our january show you would have seen the first of our new series the subject project this is where we take a popular photography subject give you a few tips on how best to shoot it and then invite you to send us your results we started with lone trees and judging by the sheer number of images that you sent in this was a popular subject now we can't possibly show them all here as we need an hour-long show to do it so here's just a small selection of a few which caught our eye keep a lookout for suitable lone trees that you can use as a focal point in your landscape images and they don't have to be massive in the frame they can be quite small and subtle just acting as an anchor point for the viewer's eye to settle on
If you sent us your Lone Tree photo but didn't see it in that collection, then you might want to join us for the next MC2 Live, where we'll be spending some more time discussing more of your Lone Tree images in some more detail. Here are the views of some of the experts as they discuss what they like and what they didn't like, while I try to keep everybody in check. It's live, it's fun, and it's open for registration by going to the relevant link down below. Now, if you watched part one of this month's show, then you'll now be armed with all the information that you need to get yourself in the right place at the right time to witness one of the most amazing natural phenomena, the Aurora Borealis. But seeing it is one thing, photographing it is another thing entirely. Here to tell us all we need to know, is he in overtime or something? It's Marcus. Previously, we looked at all the elements we need to align in order to get a great aurora photo. To quickly recap, these were Geography, you need to be in the right place on the planet. Subject, you need to have a suitable subject to use as a focal point for your aurora shots. The Moon, this needs to be well below the horizon to get truly dark skies. Weather, you need to have a clear view of the sky, so clouds are your biggest enemy here. The aurora itself, you need to have strong enough activity to get a decent shot. So let's say we've got all five of those boxes ticked and we're standing here and all of a sudden the sky erupts with aurora activity. Big curtains of green and orange and red everywhere. Sounds good, huh? Well, things can still go wrong if we don't say have the right equipment or don't know how to focus in the dark. The first thing you're going to need is a decent tripod. Now I use the word decent, meaning that if you have a flimsy one which wobbles a lot when you touch the camera, then this isn't going to keep the camera perfectly still especially if it's windy. The result is that you will get soft shots and all the hard work in getting yourself to the right location at the right time will be for nothing, all because your tripod sucks. The tripod I use is made by King Joy and is actually called the Aurora 86 and is designed to be as sturdy as tripods come. I'll put a link in the description below if you're interested in buying one. Once you have a sturdy enough camera support, there are only two other things you'll need, a camera and a lens. Although you can use any camera to photograph the aurora, it helps greatly if it performs well at high ISO settings. So if you have a camera which starts looking a bit dodgy at say ISO 1600 or above, you're going to have to resort to quite long exposure times of around 20 or 30 seconds, and that's going to impact on the detail that you can capture in the aurora itself. The longer the exposure, the less structure you will see in the delicate patterns, and you'll end up with nothing more than a colourful mist, which can still look impressive, but not as good as capturing the detail itself. When it comes to lenses, the focal range isn't really that relevant. I've shot Aurora from 14mm up to 100mm, so there's no right or wrong here. It really depends what your subject is and how much of the sky or Aurora you want to include. Now sometimes the Aurora can just be a thin green band on the horizon, and if that's the case, the last thing you want to do is shoot it with a really wide angle lens because the Aurora is going to become really small in the frame. Other times, however, it might take up a large portion of the sky and then you're going to need a really wide angle lens in order to get your subject and the aurora in shot. The most important factor when it comes to lens choice is aperture. Ideally, you want to have the fastest possible lens, typically f1.4 or 1.8, to let as much light as possible through to the camera. If you only have an f4 lens, then you're going to need to shoot at something like ISO 12800 or higher, which isn't going to give the best results. Now, using a fast lens with a maximum aperture of around f1.4 will allow you to get a good exposure of the aurora at around ISO 1600 at, say, five or six seconds. Now, that's short enough to capture the fine detail that you're going to need, and it will give you plenty of exposure to work with. You don't want to be touching the camera as it takes the photo, so either use a cable release or the two second timer. One of the most difficult parts of shooting Aurora is focusing, as this can be tricky to do in the dark if you haven't done it before. The technique, however, is fairly simple. All you want to do is make sure you are focused to infinity. However, this isn't simply a case of turning your lens all the way to the end of its focus movement, as this is likely to be beyond infinity. Now, because we're shooting with a wide open aperture, it's incredibly important that we focus as accurately as we possibly can, because any errors are going to be really noticeable. 
Point your lens at the brightest star or planet you can see in the sky. Put your camera into manual shooting mode. Select the widest aperture, an ISO of around 3200 and an exposure time of around 8 seconds. Turn autofocus off and make sure the lens cap is removed. Now activate live view and you should see tiny stars on the screen. Zoom in on the brightest one using the magnify tool. Do not zoom in using the lens as this may cause focus problems when you zoom back out. Now all you need to do to confirm focus is gently twist the focus ring backwards and forwards and you should see the star become bigger and smaller. There's no detail on the stars to focus on so you want to make them as small as they can be as this is how they appear when in sharp focus. Now once you're happy with your focus, take a test shot and examine it on the back of the camera. If it doesn't look as sharp as it did on live view, then the chances are you've got camera movement and you need to steady your tripod. If both look good, then you're good to go. You can now recompose the scene to include both your subject and the aurora. Just be careful not to reactivate autofocus or nudge the focus ring on the front of the lens from now on. Shoot in manual mode only, as the camera's exposure meter will be confused by the dark sky and will give inconsistent results as the aurora changes. Now we've already set our aperture, so to control our exposure, we need to adjust either the ISO or the exposure time, or of course a combination of both. Now it's really important that we constantly check our exposures on the back of the camera, because things will be changing very fast. But don't just rely on your eyes for this, because when you're working in the dark, your eyes will become super sensitive. So it's important that we use the histogram, otherwise the image might look a lot brighter than it actually is. Finally, a couple of tips you might want to look out for. If it's cold outside and your gear is set up for a period of more than 15 or 20 minutes, there's a good chance you will get condensation forming on the front element. Check it with a torch at various intervals, wiping away any moisture with an absorbent lens cloth. Being careful, of course, not to knock the focus ring. If condensation does become a problem, then think about buying a lens warmer, which will prevent the lens becoming cooler than the ambient air temperature and therefore attracting moisture. The battery life probably won't last as long as you're used to, especially if it's cold and if you're using the live view. There's nothing worse than having a great Aurora display and then running out of battery and not being able to take any photos of it. So make sure you've got plenty of spare batteries in your bag. Shoot in RAW as there will be lots of fine detail in the dark sky which will likely be lost if you shoot in JPEG. Don't use filters. Remove all screw-in types such as UV and skylight filters as these aren't going to benefit you in any way. Use a lens hood. This will reduce flare from any periphery light sources as well as helping to reduce condensation on the front element. Aurora displays tend to come in waves so if activity seems to be declining don't give up straight away. Wait to see if a second or third wave arrives. You can monitor when this is likely to happen on the Aurora Alerts app, which we've linked to below. Now, it's not uncommon for the Aurora to appear a little underwhelming to our eyes. Often we just see it as a white haze. But don't despair. The camera is capable of picking up a lot more colour than we can with our eyes. So if you're standing there and you think, what's the point? Then get the camera out anyway and just take a shot. You might be surprised. If you do get any success with shooting the Aurora, then feel free to share your results with us. Even if your shots didn't turn out as well as you hoped they would, we might be able to shed some light on what you can do next time to improve your success rate. I'll put our email address in the link section down below. You can also send in any questions that you might have as our experts are always happy to help where possible. So that brings us to the end of our February episodes, but you wouldn't have to wait too long before part one of our March edition, when, among other things, we'll be 
be doing a fashion shoot on the Leica SL2 to see how that performs. Don't forget, you can now become a Photography Online supporter and help us make better content for you. Just click the join button or go to the relevant link below. Please also give us a thumbs up if you appreciate the work that we put into bringing you Photography Online twice a month. It helps our content get promoted to a wider audience and also puts a smile on our faces. So until next time, you know what to do. Take good care, but most of all, take good photos. Oh,